Again, I'm Al Coppola. I have the very uh, distinct pleasure of now chairing a roundtable of writers that are working uh, as uh, 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 writing satire today on TV and other outlets. Uh, in a minute, I'll be introducing them, and in a minute, I'll be asking them to speak to about five to seven minutes or so about what it is that they do and how they understand it as satire or not, uh, and potentially what they think that satire might or might not be good for. Uh, the idea uh, that I have is for uh, a lot of ideas uh, to get out there, and then for us to have a kind of freewheeling discussion uh, precisely about the, the role that satire is playing in uh, our culture today. Um, what, so what I'm going to do is I'll introduce our speakers in the order that they will speak. Um, so our first speaker sitting closest to me is Randy Cohen. Uh, he wrote his first humor pieces for newspapers and magazines before joining the writing staff of Late Night with David Letterman, where he won three Emmy Awards. His fourth Emmy was for his work on Michael Moore's TV Nation. Uh, he received a fifth Emmy as a result of a clerical error, apparently, and he kept it. Uh, <laughs> For 12 years, you may recall, he wrote The Ethicist, a weekly column for the New York Times Magazine, and a new book, Be Good, How to Navigate the Ethics of Everything, will be published by Chronicle in September 2012. And he's currently the creator and host of Person, Place, and Thing, a public radio show produced by WAMC. Um, next up will be Jason Ross. Jason covered the arts for the Alternative Weekly in his hometown of Chico, California, before beginning work as a writer for The Daily Show with Jon Stewart in 2002. Since then, he's racked up six Emmys, a Writers Guild Award, and co-authored two books, America the Book and Earth the Book. He's also been seen on camera in the company of Muppet John McCain. Third up is Tad Lowe, the creator of the VH1 series pop-up video, which debuted in 1996 and became the highest rated show in the network's history before colonizing the pop culture of 38 other countries in worldwide syndication. Uh, Tad Lowe is also the founder of Spin the Bottle, which among other signature programming is responsible for Pants Off, Dance Off, the, yes, you guessed it, highest rated show in the history of the Fuse Network. Uh, fourth is Evan Mandry, who many of us here will recognize as the chairperson of the Department of Criminal Justice right here at John Jay College, the author of no less than 20 law review articles and a textbook on the death penalty. He's got great <laughs> jokes. He is also, you should know, the author of three comic novels, Dreaming of Gwen Stefani, First Contact, or It's Later Than You Think, which was a semi-finalist for the 2001 Thurber Prize for American Humor, and Q, which is being published in six languages other than English and is under development at Sony Pictures. And I think you should get Natalie Portman in on that project to <laughs> see what I can do. Uh, and finally, our, our uh, final speaker uh, and participant is Alison Silverman, and her writing credits include Portlandia, The Office, Late Night with Conan O'Brien, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, and The Colbert Report, which he helped launch as co-head writer and later helmed as executive producer but she's probably best known as one half of the future comedy duo Silverman and TBD. I always <laughs> like that one. So uh, what I'm going to ask is uh, for Randy to kind of kick things off and give us your thoughts. And since I know I'm asking five writers to speak more or less off the cuff about that thing that they do and they love so much, and I've allegedly only given them about seven minutes. I'm going to keep an eye on the clock and actually flash this when you get to five, and that'll give you two more minutes to go. So, and of course, if you wouldn't mind to please speak into the mic. Oh, okay. Um, I I'm turning my back to you, so I don't care what you flash. <laughs> well, I sort of care what you flash. Uh, and I have notes, so I'm not speaking off the cuff. And, and I have notes because you called me on the phone and asked me to make some notes. Such a lie. Um, that, that my bio seems like to make me an odd choice to appear here, especially the, the 12 years spent uh, writing The Ethicist. But, but I, I, there, there are a couple points, I think, that connect that job to the, the previous work I had. And there, were, there were just a couple points I wanted to make here so that my co colleagues could then contradict them all. Um, first is that the opposite of funny isn't serious, it's somber. That, that, that to, to suggest that the opposite of funny is serious trivializes comedy, I, I think. It, uh, funny is just, a, it's a rhetorical choice, it's a, it's a choice of tone, um, how you want to make your argument or how you want to make an assertion about the world. And, and um, 
uh, Coleridge said that the true comic is the blossom on the nettle. Don't you think that's nice? Do you think of yourself as the blossom of the nettle? Sweet. And Shaw said, um, life does not cease to be funny when people die and any more than it ceases to be funny. I'm sorry, life does not cease to be funny when people die any more than it ceases to be serious when people laugh. That, 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 that seems true for what, what these people do work I admire, that, that because they're funny does not mean they are not serious. They're serious people, I think. Um, I'd also like to suggest that, that there's ethical and unethical comedy, and that in my tenure at Late Night, we were taught uh, to, to write ethical comedy, that, that, that Dave was engaged in, in a fundamentally moral enterprise. And at first, the show was actually about something. It had a central thesis, which was, in my view, that the show, um, here's what the show was about, that our childhoods had been bought and sold um, in order for other people to market crap. Um, in, in particular, crap television and crap movies. And the show was meant to be a critique of that. Um, and, and in effect, to defend our childhood against commodification. Um, this was never handed out in the show manual for writers, um, but this is something I, I came to intuit over the years, uh, that, that Dave is an essentially serious person, that he lives in a moral universe. You know, He has a sense of right and wrong, which, believe me, is not true on every show I worked on. Um, there were a couple other things, I think, that made his comedy moral comedy. Uh, one is that we were never to attack the weak and the helpless. Um, we were to attack the powerful, never to bully their victims. Uh, and another guideline was we were only to attack people for things that were volitional, like choosing to be in a crap movie, um, not for things over which they had no control, like losing their hair, having you know a horrible nose. Um, that, to me, constituted moral comedy. Uh, there were a couple other lessons I think I, I, I learned there. Again, none of this, there, there were no discussions, there was no manual, you just, you learned this from your colleagues, the way I guess any institution has a set of values. Um, I learned to be wary of the it's just a joke defense, that, that it seems to me that every joke is an assertion about the world. Um, and I used to share an office with a monologue guy, a, a particular skill. On our show there were two people who wrote monologue, opening jokes. They were specialists, and, and they were respected for it. I respect them for it. Um, but, but they tend to be, I think, anxious, um, insecure people who constantly want to read you their jokes when you share an office with them. And if you didn't like, not, not, not the craft of the joke, but what the joke was saying, um, that sometimes my colleague would say, it's just a joke. And I think that's a kind of moral cowardice that you have to believe what your work asserts about the world. I don't have to believe it, but if you don't believe it, you're a hack or worse. Um, and, and I think this came up lately in the, when, when Robert De Niro was attacked for that, um, it's a good time for, for maybe the country's ready for a, a, a white first lady. He never should have apologized. I thought that was a good joke. That, 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 joke, asserted, uh, that joke asserted that Michelle Obama had, had taken a lot of knocks utterly unfairly, and they were racist knocks. And he just turned that around and made a, a nice little joke. He never should have apologized. And, and it was a, a, another example of Obama breaking my heart once again when he said, oh, this was inappropriate. Well, you know, the White House did. It wasn't inappropriate. It, it, was, it was true. Um, oh, the, yeah, there's one. I, I feel I'm running. How am I doing? For, uh, three minutes. Fine. Two more minutes. But sure, I have another sure. 10 pages. <laughs> 10 pages. You know what you do? You just read the first letters okay, all the, the way down. All right, all right. Something acrostically well, um, will emerge. I, 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 okay, uh, I'll, I'll make just one other point, and, and it goes to something that, that, that was, I think, said at the end of the last session about, does any of this count for something? Does satire have power? Um, I think it's, it, it was easy on our show to think that we were big shots and to swagger around, and, and, and that, uh, oh, our lethal barbs were you know, causing sleepless nights in the corridors of power. But I learned to be wary of, of giving myself too much credit. Um, and and the, the occasion on which I learned was completely chastening. Was, I worked there, uh, there uh, a long, long ago when, when NBC was just bought by GE. And Dave started doing this line of comedy of making fun of our new powerful overlords by calling them these GE pinheads. And he was much admired, he was praised for oh, his guts, his courage for tackling these powerful people. So six months later is our Christmas show. Um, and, and that's it's for, it's uh, and there's a party and it's for the staff but also it's for you know big shots to come in, and and the big shots that came that year were Robert Wright, 
the head of NBC and Jack Welch, the, the, the head of General Electric, you know, genuinely powerful people. Um, and, and I was not invited, you know, to sit at the big kids' table. But, but I did make sure I, I got a table next to where, the, you know, the grown-ups sat so you could hear what they said. And this is what they said. Um, Robert Wright said to Dave, I love when you call us GE Pinheads. That's so funny. Uh, and, and Jack Welch just agreed. He thought that, they thought that was hysterical. And, and, and Dave was genuinely struck by this. Because I think what the lesson was is it in no way threatened these guys. It humanized them. It made them look like good guys who can go along with the joke. They can take a joke. And we were, in effect, doing PR for them. We were not a threat to them. We were their little puppets that, that they put on little puppet shows on their behalf. If we were a threat to them, we wouldn't be on the air. Um, and, and there are a couple ways you can tell if, you're, if, if what you're doing is, is toothless. Uh, one is that if the people who, who you're ostensibly searing with your lethal comedy um, agree to come on your show, um, I don't think so. Um, and that's what happens on Saturday Night Live every week. Oh, and they think it's great when these people come on. It's like proving they're completely impotent. Um, and, and I think if you're invited to the White House by the people you're supposedly just devastating with your lethal comedy, you might want to think about that. Well, on that uh, sort, of, sort of power of the people moment there, I think we'll pass it to, to Jason. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, uh, thank you, Al. <clears throat> and Al, Al and I also had a, a talk yesterday, and you were dead wrong. These people are very handsome. Uh, I, don't, I don't know no, where I'm you sorry, came myself, in with that. Myself. No, I'm, well, um, uh, like, like Randy, I, I uh, used to, I, I work on a TV show now where uh, we, we're, we're confronted all the time with, uh, well, here's a joke that some people like and some people don't. Uh, in the room, and, they, and, and suddenly the debate breaks out. Is it, is it basically, we don't use this language, but is it an ethical joke or is it not an ethical joke? And, and, it, and it always boils down to something like the formulation you gave about, is, is, are, we, are we blaming something for someone? Is this person big or are they small? And, uh, and, and do they have power over their situation or not? They, those, those things are, uh, are, are you, know, you, you can kind of feel them. Uh, I, I feel like uh, laughter and, and humor uh, in, in our earliest forms, uh, I, I have this theory that laughter is, is I'm sorry, that humor is, um, is intrinsically conservative because it, it is just so mean and so, uh, uh, it, it's, it can be so hurtful and it is always, uh, you always have to ignore uh, the counter argument in order to make a joke. You always, there's, all, there, there, there's ridiculous things out there that actually exist for pretty good reasons and they only look ridiculous when, when you're looking at them with the fresh eyes of a, of a, of a child or, or a, a comedian. <laughs> and. Uh, and you, and you kind of have to ignore the, 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 the reasonableness of unreasonable things in order to make jokes about them. And I, and I feel like that, is a, the, the, like that uh, kind of bullheadedness is, is, is a conservative thing. But you, you, know, you got me thinking that maybe that's just really a, a yin and yang of it. Because um, on the schoolyard, what, what, are, what, what are some of the first jokes we ever make? Ha ha, there's a retarded kid. You know, look at the and it's and it's and it's awful and and that and those jokes. You know, we grow up still making those jokes and those jokes exist in the adult world as well. Uh, but there's also the the laughter of a child at his parent who is who 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 loves him or her and is and is you know jingling keys or making a funny face or something. And uh, and and we do those jokes for each other as well as adults. Uh, so it, it might be more complicated than uh, than than I. Anyway, I'm sort of a half half witted theorist about this stuff. <laughs> uh, uh, Mostly, I'm uncomfortable with the stature that satire has taken on in the last ten years. I, it, it would, you know, but here I am, you know, basking. Uh, the, I'll take all the money and fame that it wants to give me, but like at heart, I'll, I, I, I wish that uh, I, I worry that our culture holds up satire as some sort of solution, and I don't think it holds much in the way of solutions. Um, and. Uh, I, I, I wish that you know there were just fewer mockable things. <laughs> I wish that we looked for solutions that way rather than looking for more and more ways to mock them as we see them. And you know, the, not that I don't like comedy, and not that I don't want a lot of comedy writers to work, but when I start seeing uh, uh, you know uh, flourishes of, of uh, attempted satire in straight news media, uh, you know, if you want to call cable news that. It really it, it bugs me. I, I because as much as, you know, the Daily Show is probably is is pretty famous for being a, a, a devastating critic of the press. But we really love good reporting, and we really uh, we really admire the people who do a really good job of, of reporting news well and straight, 
and, uh, and, and getting you know, the people the information they need to be informed. So, you know, as corny as it sounds, we, we love that stuff when it's out there. And, I, and uh, I, I, as, a, as a satirist, I, uh, I, I am of, of two minds, as, as I guess, as, uh, as I see our craft uh, sort of rise to the level, as, as some people were saying, that you know, it leads to White House invitations and, and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, that's about all I got. That's great, Jason. Um, so why don't we pass it to Ted Lowe, spin, uh, spin the bottle on pop-up video. Thanks, Al. Okay, so uh, I guess, unlike uh, these guys, we, we didn't have the, uh, uh, we didn't have the issue where, where there were possibly, where we would be possibly making fun of, um, of the powerless in, on pop-up, uh, and nor did we have the, uh, Complicit agreement uh, from the the artists that we took on, which which was great because it was like a uh, an open playing field uh, for for pop shots, no pun intended. In fact, I like to let everybody know this: the the whole origin of the show of Papa Video came from a friend of mine who was a, a stylist for uh, Mariah Carey, and she would uh, come back from a day on the shoot with Mariah where. Uh, it was just one ridiculous request after another, like, don't shoot me on the right side of my face. I'm not getting into that swimming pool unless it's been, you know, drained, cleaned, refilled with Evian. It, one thing after another. I mean, she would seriously, I mean, check into a hotel room, make her people go up and re-scrub the tub. And I thought, wow, you know, this is like a celebrity's gone wild. There's no, there needs to be some sort of lifeguard here. Somebody needs to blow a whistle. And so that's where, well, that's the whole uh, genesis, with, it's all about Mariah. And, uh, it, and, and, and it was fun when the show first hit the air because, because uh, you know, if you think about it, a music video is really nothing more than an infomercial to get people to buy uh, or know about an album and hopefully buy it back then rather than download it. And, uh, and the whole point of a music video is to have as many people watch your music video. And what happened was on, um, on pop-up was the popped videos, the ones that would say critical things and, and uh, talk about sort of what really what really went on behind the scenes, ended up getting ratings that were three to four times higher than um, than the unpopped video. So it was kind of like the anatomy of watching a rock star's head explode. In one case, like you can imagine Meatloaf going to his manager and being like, you know, uh, listen, who allowed this? They're making fat jokes uh, on top of, um, you know. Uh, my videos and his manager said, "Yeah, but meet. We're we're back on the we're back on the charts. People people are watching. They're buying." So, um, but likewise, when it comes to corridors of power, like that Randy was talking about, uh, uh, we did get in a lot of trouble. In fact, uh, a lot a lot of these artists b before Papo came around, uh, there was a very much of a, a a close relationship between the, the and there still is between the, the music industry and uh, Viacom networks. And you know, if you wanted to have uh, the Wallflowers appear on the MTV Video Music Awards or on some VH1 award show, well, you know, it's not going to go over so well uh, if you've just, just been making fun of Jacob Dylan. By the way, we love to make fun of Jacob Dylan. Uh, he reportedly hated any time anybody mentioned the fact that he was actually the son of Bob Dylan. So whenever we would pop a, 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 head, a Wallflowers video, like him from particular one headlight, we would go out of our way just to constantly do Bob Dylan jokes like, you know, yeah, the, the, you know, it was 40 degrees out here when this was shot, but, you know, it was actually minus two, blowing in the wind, it's just after, again and again. And you can imagine, like, when uh, the VH1 talent people would call and be like, hey, do the Wallflowers want to come and be on the show? They're like, so uh, uh, it caused a lot of trouble. I, my other theory, of course, is that a lot of people early on, uh, Al told me not to mention this, but uh, the people who worked at VH1 back early on were radio people, and uh, and you know what they say about about radio people, at least the, the the faces of radio people, and so for the first time in their lives, a lot of these guys were getting were getting action. They were working at VH1. All of a sudden, uh, the, you know, this show came along. Maybe you weren't getting uh, the front row seats, the backstage passes as much anymore. So what happened was, the uh, the lawyers started clamping down and asking us to remove stuff. Can we do the thing up here? Absolutely. Okay, I'm going to show you. Okay, first of all, this is one of my favorite ones, as far as satire goes. My feeling is like, the fewest amount of words, the better, and everybody knows Adam Duritz, the pretentious uh, lead singer from uh, uh, Counting Crows, so I just love the notion of putting him next to Rolf, the piano-playing dog from the Muppets. 
Uh, and you know, it, it, part of the whole process was to sort of demystify the rock star mythology. So on this next one, you can see we, we show you that AJ from uh, Backstreet Boys, he's actually faking his tear, you know. It, it just got everybody all worked up. It just screwed up everything. I mean, it was like, for a while, it was a big publicity machine. It just play along. And this, the, we weren't playing along. So the lawyers got mad. And OK, don't, don't hit it yet. So what we would do, OK, there it is. But what we would do is uh, in every um, second of, of, of video, there's 30 frames. And, and this was back in 1996. So this was prior to like TiVo and stuff like that. So every time the lawyers would ask us to take stuff out, we would, we would write it all up onto one frame of video and hide it into the hide it in the credits. And the only way people and you should take a look at that, that you can see faintly there. And that's how people found it. They would videotape the show and then go forward for, for one frame at a time. And we put all the stuff in there that the, the lawyers had told us to take out. And when I'll tell you, when VH1 found out about that, whoa, that was a great day. <laughs> so um, yeah. That's that's what else. I mean that's sort of the, the story of Pop Up. We've just taken them on. Uh, uh, Mariah, I talked about Adam Duritz. We're good, Tad. Yeah. yeah, that's it. That's the yeah. story of Pablo. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Tad. Yeah. Uh, we're going to pass it to Evan now. Uh, I'll say two preliminary things. Uh, one is, I don't know if any of you remember this speech, but Conan O'Brien spoke at class day at Harvard. I feel like it's about 10 years ago. Did you write that speech by any chance? I didn't, but uh, I love it. Yeah, and his first line is that uh, I need to be funny than Armatia Sen, and as some of you may know, we had a conference here on Armatia Sen, and I was on one of the academic panels, uh, and Sen was there, and Conan is very safe. Uh, and the second preliminary thing is that I feel as if um, I'm conscious in, in the way that, um, I don't know if you play golf or do anything like that, that when you try to think mechanically about what you're doing, that you're basically, it's basically impossible to do it that in trying to speak academically about being funny, that it's almost impossible to be funny. So I'm very uh, worried that everything I'm going to say sounds very, very serious. Um, Al asked me to uh, think about why uh, I do that part of my life that I do. Um, and I'm going to try to answer it as best I can with one substantial caveat. Uh, the caveat is that what I most like in comedy is physical comedy. Uh, my son, who's sitting in the front, and I watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, and we love it. And uh, I can't intellectualize that uh, in, any, in any way. But with respect to what I do, um, uh, I understand uh, myself to be working out uh, a series of very, very difficult problems uh, in the only socially acceptable way that I understand. Uh, I think if you're a thinking human being, life is full of very deep, existentially angsty questions. And um, there are only a few options that I can think of. One is you just are incapacitated. You just drop dead out of <laughs> terror about what's going to go on. Uh, many, many people turn to religion. And I think that's really a way of soothing existential angst. And then there's a large swaths of mostly New York Jewish liberals who try to make jokes out of it. That's what I understand Woody Allen to have been doing for his entire life, rationalizing in a very public way uh, his behavior. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I like Woody Allen. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to say anything critical, though, obviously, a critical thing to be said. Um, and so I'm, I understand myself to be interacting with folks uh, who make that same choice to say that, okay, I'm going to still wake up in the morning, even though when I die, I may, uh, you know, disinfect dissolve into a black box, and this has all been pointless. And um, so, you know, in my, uh, my books, I've been working out questions that interest me. Um, what makes human beings different from other animals? Is love transcendent? Um, my second book, uh, I was very upset about um, the second Bush election. I didn't understand it, and I was trying to make sense of how can I coexist with people who seem to have such a completely different set of uh, priorities than I do. And, recent book, it's um, uh, talking about whether progress is a real idea or something, this idea that life gets better, or is that such something that we, uh, we do um, to try to convince ourselves that life is aimed at some higher purpose. But of course, describing these things, it doesn't sound funny at all. I mean, it, you know, I, I, the book is full of jokes. Uh, mostly what I do I is I, I, 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think mostly what I do, my wife, who's sitting in the front row, I don't think she would have ever been interested in me if I weren't funny. I think most comedians will tell you they're very interested in people finding them attractive or appealing for some reason. It's a very basic human need. I'm sure there are some insecurities that I'm working out in a public way by trying to be uh, funny. Lord knows I have hosts of insecurity. Um, that's what I understand it to be. I, I do have to say one thing Randy said, and I, I read his column for years, and I loved it, and I never knew, uh, though I'm delighted to hear that he wrote for Letterman, and uh, you mentioned the period, that that was my period of watching Letterman, and I, I understood Letterman to be making social commentary, um, and I appreciate it. I, I, I actually find, I mean, these folks are all associated with shows that have great meaning to me. Um, I love The Daily Show, I love Stephen Colbert's show, I love Portlandia, by the way. And um, I, I do think it's a connection that you're making with human beings uh, at a different level than you might ordinarily. It's a very subtle type of conversation that's going on. And I think it's very, very significant. I'll just close by saying this because I hope this might be funny. Uh, Randy's comments about ethical humor. So I used to do stand-up. I did stand-up for several years. And my first routine, which I'm now solely telling for academic purposes, so if you don't think it's funny, uh, was about uh, the Disney Corporation taking over an abandoned concentration camp and turning it into a theme park. And um, somebody, my dad, who was seated in the front row, booed me during that routine. <laughs> but I would defend that routine um, because I was making an ethical statement about large corporations. And I was illustrating it in a way uh, that was very vivid. But I do think uh, that comedians need to own their jokes. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm always making a, uh, the most profound statement of things I'm saying, but that, but that thing you said resonated with me uh, very, very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask people to do that, Alison Silver. Alison, just come over to the mic. OK, yeah, let's see. Yeah, no one else brought clips, guys? Uh, <laughs> I brought a clip because I wasn't sure what I'd have to say. Um, I'm, really, uh, I'm really so glad to be speaking last because you guys said some great stuff and um, elucidated a lot of things and I was under the impression that this is a panel about being a woman in comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is every panel I've ever asked to be on, it's the first one. Didn't I tell you that's what I wanted to talk about? Uh, uh, it's an endless, endless uh, question for uh, lots of folks. Um, so, uh, uh, gosh, yeah, a lot of things that people said um, uh, I, I, I found resonated with me, um, and uh, you know, I, I, I thought that I'd talk about my experience being a satirist because, uh, or being a comedy writer. I, I don't really think of myself as a satirist, but being a comedy writer uh, because I, I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of overarching feeling uh, thoughts about it. Um, uh, but uh, so. One of the things that Randy was saying when you were talking about De Niro and uh, that point where he said this, and then there was, I, I believe you said, uh, it wasn't inappropriate, it was true. Um, and I love that. And um, when I'm thinking of something that I want to write about, or when we're thinking about things for Colbert and Portlandia and various things, a lot of times uh, the way I would approach it would be to think, like, what is being, what is unsaid right now in the culture? Um, what is in the ether? that hasn't been articulated. And that's something that can be sort of ruminated on for a while. Um, sometimes it would take like, you know, a month or two of starting to see like, hi, this story kind of reminds me of that other story. And, and I just heard someone say this thing on the street and I think that there's something bubbling that hasn't really been articulated. Um, so that, for me, is an ideal to find something like that. Um, and uh, then hopefully it's something you also have a point of view about. Um, one of the most, certainly for me, the guiding principle and, and the sort of more pointed stuff that I've done is um, another thing that Randy said, like uh, about the uh, uh, monologue writers, that uh, it wasn't the joke that you weren't laughing at; it was um, what the joke was saying. Um, and I think that you really, before, it, not only is it. Um, you know, just more ethical in general, but it's also a great joke generator to just be really specific and understand what your point of view is on something. Um, if you don't have it, uh, I, I just don't think anything is, is really going to hit. It's very hard to get things to hit. Um, 
Uh, also, uh, so in writing for these various shows, I was trying to think about like if I had sort of any evolution as a writer. Um, and I think that what I started doing, um, or, or one way that I was approaching things for a while was uh, as an outsider, um, commenting on things that I thought were absurd or wrong or what have you. This is sort of the classic like Mort Saul type uh, thing. And I, 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 you know, Daily Show does some of that, does some other stuff too. Um, then when I started working on Colbert, it was he, you know, embodies this other thing instead. So he, uh, as a character, is talking as an insider. And um, uh, uh, when he talks about the right wing or whatever is on his mind that night. Um, then after I left that show, of course that was about pretending to be on the side of what you're actually satirizing. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting to me about Portlandia, I kind of felt like I sort of shoveled so much scorn on so many targets that it was time to like reserve some of that disdain for myself. Um, and I was sort of interested in, in looking at um, my lifestyle and what was kind of ridiculous about it um, and, uh, and what I should be completely pilloried for. Um, and that is what uh, the clip I brought from uh, Portlandia. I hope that. Oh, Maggie's running late. Okay. Oh, sorry, guys. Wait, wait. Okay. Hey, did you guys read that thing in the New Yorker last month about how golf is an analogy for marriage? I did. Mm -hmm. I did read that. Do you know the thing at McSweeney's? Mm -hmm. I was comparing CD tracks and album tracks and I read that. Yeah. Did you read that thing in Mother Jones about yeah. eco chairs and eco ways to sit? I did. Yeah. I did. Did you read that thing in Spain about all the festivals? Uh huh. Did you read that thing in Pace? It was about the National. Oh, I saw that. Did you read that thing in Dwell about all the mid century houses? Yeah. Did you read the New York Times? Yes. The New York Observer? Yes. Washington Post? Yes. Wall Street Journal? Of course I read. Did you read that steampunk article in Boys Wife? I did not like the end of it. Did you read that Siren in the Lambert River? Yes. Did you read a fortune cookie? Yes. From last night? Yes. Did you read it? Yes. There were two. Yes. Did you read that thing that guy wrote in the sand on the beach? Yeah. Did you read the Portland Mercury? Yeah. Did you read the Willamette Week? Yeah. Did you read the Seattle Stranger? Beginning to end. Did you read the SF Weekly? I loved it. The Harvard Lampoon? Well written. Did you read Mad Magazine? I did not like the end of it. Did you read Kathy? No, I was too. Did you read Family Circus? Sure. Did you read Calvin and Hobbes? Sure. Did you read The Boston Globe? Sure. Did you read The Washington Blade? We read it together. Did you read? Uh -huh. Did you read? Mm -hmm. Did you read? Of course I did. Did you read? I read it to a friend of mine. Did you read the closing credits of that movie? Yeah, did you read that book? Did you read the Bible? Did, did you read it? Did you read it? Did you read it? Finger writing on the window? Did you read it? 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 Did you to become a very uh, angry person <laughs> um, uh, and to let things, to let your sort of choice to sort of find things that uh, you, you think are wrong or need to be exposed or whatever to lead you um, into a, a, a kind of sad life. Um, and uh, I think it's a really deliberate choice on um, certainly the people that worked with Stephen Colbert and, and various other people to um, to try and not do that. And uh, when you were talking about, again, with Letterman and, and um, the choices there, certainly on, you know, everyone up here on the shows they've been working on, I, I think that there's a, a real choice to sort of try and proceed with joy. Um, and uh, at Colbert, we would, we would call the show The Joy Machine. Um, and I think that's partially, it's one of the reasons why um, people are so quick to say, like, you know, we're not news, we're comedy. Um, one of the reasons. Um, and the other thing I'd just like to say is I, I, I think that, well, when I left Colbert, I, I was very burned out and just kind of had to settle and stuff. Um, and I started getting, uh, the people who were sort of interested in contacting me and, and had sort of positions they were interested in, in me taking were uh, CNN. It was Piers Morgan, 
Anderson Cooper. Um, and I think that clearly it's that part of the um, story that is sort of moving closer to comedy, I think. Um, I think more so than comedy is, is moving towards news in any way. Thank you. Um, I, I want to thank all of you for really thoughtful opening remarks. Um, I, um, you know, I'll, I'll say by design, I've, I've sort of asked uh, people to come here that represent really kind of different, very different ways of thinking about uh, doing satire. And, I, and certainly I know that nobody uh, puts satirist on the 1040 right to the, the, the IRS. That might not even have been something that you would have thought about yourself before I said, let's do this. But to challenge you to think about what, you know, what it is that you do as satire, what do you think about satire and its possibilities, is something that I wanted to hear from people working at The Daily Show and working at Colbert. But also, I'm so glad that you were able to screen us a, a clip from Portlandia, which really is in a different key. It's turning that sort of ability to make fun on oneself. Um, I have tons of questions, but I'm the least interesting person up here at the front of the room, so I think it would be more interesting to sort of open things up to let you guys ask some questions and for our panelists to speak a little more to you and to each other. Uh, and again, since we are kind of uh, uh, filming this, we're going to pass the mic and I'll just ask you to please uh, speak a question into it. Um, so, so if you want to speak first. So thank you guys. This is like a huge treat. Um, my question is really for Jason. And it's, I mean, Allison maybe would want to weigh in, because you guys both Oh, no, I will answer it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you guys both mentioned the way in which you're seeing um, satire take a bigger space, right? And the question of how that's entering into news. Well, my question is about politics, right? One of the things I, I recently, um, you know, wrote about Herman Cain's trying to say, I'm going to bring humor to the White House, right? This idea that... Politicians keep using, it was just a joke in recent times in ways to sort of say, look, whatever. And, and it, my question that I, I was curious about was what extent, to what extent are, is the success of things like the Colbert Report and The Daily Show making politicians, giving them in a way that space to kind of want to be hip and cool and entertaining? I mean, is that a sort of unintended backlash? just the way we're seeing it in the news, right? So because of the fact that both John Stewart and Colbert are engaging in politics too. Uh, I, it's certainly unintended, it, but uh, it, 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 if, it, if that is where, where it's coming from. I think something Randy hinted at with the, um, with the GE suits, uh, you know, happily yucking it up with Dave, uh, you know, politicians want to prove that they're in on the joke too as a way to defuse the, uh, the, you know, the, the point of that joke, I think. Um, and so they, you know, they're, they're, they're quick to come on the show, they're quick to try and, well, some of them anyway, so, you know, some try with more or less success to be funny. Some of them actually are funny, not too many. Uh, they, it, and I just say that as a, as a eager consumer, not as a comedy writer. You know, I, 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 I will laugh at a lot of things. Um, uh, you know, we have, I, I, I guess I haven't seen a ton of of attempts at comedy in politics, it, it's there. Like the, I think the general kind of informal loosening up of the dialogue of, of politics is something that's been going on for a while. I think it might be a part of that. Um, when we, you know, we sometimes we have. Uh, well, uh, my my favorite political joke was uh, when uh, about five years ago when uh, John Kerry. Uh, it was probably leading up to two thousand eight uh, when John Kerry made a joke about uh, John McCain. That uh, ended with uh, with the punchline, uh, suggesting he would be that John McCain would be incontinent, uh, and it ended with the punchline. Well, it depends, uh, <laughs> and uh, which and unlike Robert De Niro's uh, joke, which I agree, I don't think he should have apologized for because that was a, a purely beautiful little elegant turn of phrase. This was something that was really kind of you know it, it was it was just it was just mean, uh, but still I think he probably could have gotten away with it, but he, because he's John Kerry, he tried to apologize and have it, the same, and so he's like, well, you know, there's these comedians with these jokes, and I think you've heard this joke lots of places, and uh, certainly uh, you've got Jay Leno, and there's, oh, anyway, uh. I didn't mean any offense, uh, and so we ended up making a, um, we, we did it, we have a guy uh, named Steve Bodo on our staff who does a, a pretty good uh, John Kerry uh, impression, we made a, 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 
a, a fake uh, CD uh, greatest hits of John Kerry's jokes, and we like mocked him up against a, a brick wall and, and played him these these jokes that all just kind of fell flat as he as he tried to lengthen them out. Uh, so there's something you know that we came across and we had some fun with. I guess I'm not seeing it as a huge uh, a, a huge phenomenon in politics, which I'm glad for. Uh, but I think it's part of the more kind of informal. Oh zone. yeah, no. I mean, I, I see your point. I just I found it really interesting how Herman Cain referred to his electrified fence as a joke. Those kind, like that phrase. Like yeah, I was just joking, and I'm not. I mean, I'm with you, but yeah. I, but yeah. I thought, would that have happened ten years ago? What well, do you say? Well, I mean, I don't think Herman Cain I mean, wouldn't have happened ten years ago. <laughs> right, so it's right. you know he he was sui generis in a lot of ways. Uh, <laughs> And I, you know, he, you know, he surprised me every day. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm sad he's gone. Uh, so. Thank you all for coming today. I've really enjoyed hearing what you've had to say. Um, I was intrigued by something Allison said about trying to think of something that's not been said before. And I think maybe the GE pinhead remark would be along those lines. There's something kind of shocking about calling people in such power pinheads. But um, I think the clip that we saw just now was funny because we have heard that said and it did feel familiar and that's why we liked it. And um, I'm just wondering, if you see a difference between satire as filling a space with something unsaid and new and taking what has been said to the extreme. Uh, so I agree with you. We've definitely heard that. What, what I felt was new about it was seeing it as a competitive situation um, and understanding the sort of um, uh, the hostility underneath conversations like that. That's what I, that's what I intend when I say there's something out there. But certainly the, the words that are being used and the sort of comments that are being used are, are very familiar, and I think that is part of what um, I like about that. Um, but there's something else that comes to mind, which I sometimes think about in, in terms of um, whether, whether I like jokes or not, whether it's a joke that I would be proud to put on the air or not, and, and that's kind of the idea of jokes that follow versus jokes that lead. Um, and I, I think there are a lot of jokes, and I'll, I'll just go, I'm going to go for the really common denominator um, um, stuff from, and, and old, to be honest, too. But like um, old jokes like, oh, you know, Paris Hilton is a slut or something. And there, is a, there was a lot uh, of humor about Paris Hilton is a slut uh, five years ago or so. And it, I felt like it was all sort of following the idea that, oh, we've all agreed upon this. We've all agreed that, uh, that this is uh, something to be laughed at about her. Um, and they were just recycled, recycled jokes. And it would just be sort of easy to, to make that joke about her, obviously. I'm, I'm now repeating myself. But so that's a, obviously a joke that follows. And um, jokes that lead, I think, are, are, you know, are the ones where you're making an observation that is true, uh, hopefully, and um, that maybe people haven't really pinpointed yet. And obviously, it's a lot rarer to, to find those. But um, sometimes you do it, and everyone sort of starts to agree. Like, no, you're right. That is that is the the uh, the correct observation. I have something to um, that that when when. when I think what we're saying is every joke has to have an actual, well, it's crazy, an idea. Other, otherwise, if you're just doing Paris Hilton's The Slut, it's just hack work. Yeah. That you have to tell me something I don't know. Um, and, and that it works both on the micro and the macro level. That, that I think um, a joke, when it's just a simple one-liner, you set up a, a chain of logic, right, and then you break it. That's the punchline. It has to be unexpected, even, even in that way, that your mind's going this way, and then, and then it goes that way. And that I thought a show like, well, for Colbert's show, where it's a contrived persona, or for our show, where Dave was a, kind of an exaggerated version of the actual thing, it's his sensibility that the show is about, that, that he sees the world in an unexpected way just because of the way he sees it. And our job as writers was to put him in these Dave 
like positions where he could give us what was a fresh perspective, that, that it was surprising in that way. Um, and I thought that's one of the reasons I admire, well, both your, your boss, who's now been at it for a while, and, and, and Dave has been at it for 30 years, is when it's sensibility. Like, I turn on your show partly because you guys do a good job as writers, but partly because it's how John sees the world. And that's surprising. But that once you get to, the show gets really popular, um, we know how John sees the world because we've been watching him for years. We've been watching Dave for 30 years that you can keep it fresh and still be surprised, I think is just a testament to you guys. It's pretty incredible. And, and, and to, to him as well. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's never phoned in or posted on a single day. So it's, can I add one other thing about the, the um, about your Portlandia clip? Where there's a, another kind of freshness where while, while the phenomena you observed is something we we can all recognize, but no one pointed it out before. And there's this thing Alan Alan Bennett says about one of the joys of fiction. He says sometimes you're reading a book and someone says something that you've thought without even realizing you've thought it, and he says it's like someone reaches out and takes your hand. And it's just great. Um, uh, it's it? just a coincidence that I happen to be sitting next to her, and so I grabbed the microphone. Um, um, I want to um, say that I have always thought of satire as the most dangerous form of creative writing. Um, that historically, traditionally, it has gone, it's framed uh, things from a perspective that is designed to uh, challenge and offend not necessarily only those who are in power, but those who have powerful identifications um, in their minds, you know, to kind of um, shake them up. And it seems that what we're really describing here is a way of sanitizing or defanging satire. And I, I'd like to see whether, first of all, you agree with that, and whether it's worth it to try to locate the danger of satire and whether there would be a benefit uh, for doing that. I mean, one, I'll just kind of give an example of something dangerous that has recently been done within the last 10 years that has seemed to me to be satirical, which is Peter Greenaway's uh, The Cook, The Thief, His Wife, and Her Lover. I don't know if any of you saw that. You did, but if you do, did see it, you'll know that it includes cannibalism, the eating of feces, child abuse, um, it's represented, <laughs> it's totally not funny, and yet the, it's framed in a way that I think of as satirical, be, because it adopts a perspective that invites us to uh, distance ourselves, and, uh, and so I'd like to you know, just with that example to uh, get your take on that. And I, I can well, also just pass the microphone. Well, I mean, it, it does get to, uh, for example, a distinction that I think I, I heard in you, Randy, and you, Tad's account. Uh, Randy, you left us with the thought that be careful of assuming that your satire has as much power as you think, right? Uh, satire with this reputation for the lawless, dangerous, uh, avenging sword. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, people will call it uh, a supplement to public laws or something like that. And maybe it is sometimes, but sometimes not. And Ted, it sounded like you wanted to talk about your work at Pop-Up Video as actually making a difference, disturbing the, the artist, throwing a monkey wrench into the machine. Uh, you know, I, it's it's... I, if I get your question right, it's to that issue. I mean, what, what is the difference that satire is making and how does it do it? It sounded like there was, very few of you guys were, were prepared to say, yeah, we're really making big changes here. Is that because we're shy folk? Or do you think that that's just not what really is happening? I, I, I certainly uh, am not out to change anybody's mind or move the needle a single bit. And it's not because I don't think needles should be moved and I wouldn't like to see society change in certain ways, but I, I don't have the tools to do it. And I think uh, the point at which you start to trade your, uh, your, your entertainment value for some sort of persuasive uh, effect, you start to lose. It's like eating your seed corn. Next year, you're not going to be entertaining anymore, and there went your chance to do anything. That's not my take on it. 
I do, I do find the, the culture kind of uh, sad, only in that uh, the, the sort of deification of the, the, the people that were essentially uh, in drama club uh, in high school, and not to take anything away from drama club, but the, the fact that the entire culture is like, wow, you know, in the magazines and every, it, it, I find that to be sad. And, uh, and then, then the, uh, on top of that, that the, the game is rigged for these uh, graduates of the drama club in that uh, all of their imagery is, uh, you know, uh, puffed up and there's a lot of uh, framing and, and uh, stuff that you're not, as the consumer, aware of. I, I think it engenders just overall feelings of inadequacy, kind of like uh, getting constant updates on uh, what your friends are doing on Facebook, and they're all sort of slightly marketed to just show you the good stuff. I think it does does cause a cultural uh, malaise, yeah. If, if I understand, you have uh, laid it out that satire can either be about ourselves or it can be about the powerful and pretentious. Uh, I, I once asked Bill Gallo, the sports cartoonist of the Daily News, uh, what did George Steinbrenner think of those cartoons you, you had of him every day, of Baron von Steingraber, George Steinbrenner in a, in a World War I German-Prussian helmet? And he said he loved it. And he would say, what did Gallo write about me today? He always wanted to, to know about it. And uh, with the Obamas, I'm wondering, do they think they're too big to be made uh, part of a joke? Do they not have a sense of humor? Is being the first black president just such a serious issue that no one can uh, make jokes about it the way we could make jokes about the Kennedys and the first family? Right. And I, I, just, I just wanted to bring up one other example, and that was Don Imus and referring to the Rutgers University women's basketball team as nappy-headed hoes on the air and then being shocked that people were offended. And er then suddenly it became a question of him defending himself again. I'm not a racist, I'm not a racist. And I was thinking it wasn't about race or being a racist or not. There was something deeply offensive about that that wasn't necessarily race. So I'm wondering whether I'm getting you right. Well, you're getting Don Imus wrong. Um, he is a racist and he is a misogynist. I just didn't think he was funny. I didn't understand why you were talking about that. I really agree with that. I thought Imus's crime in that instance was, it wasn't funny and that if it had been done in a no, creative way. No, he's a racist and a misogynist uh, I, I and he's not funny. I can't vouch for that. Uh, and he probably could have gotten away with it if he was funny. I mean, plenty of people do. Um, but I, if I can go back to the, the, just to wrap up the previous thing, just a little bit, no, I, I'm talking too much. But, but um, I don't think, I don't think there is, Danger of satire now. That that there are there are plight, there are parts of the world where editorial cartoonists will get thrown into prison, um, and, and the United States is not one of them. So that it, it's a romantic notion and an, an anachronistic notion that people doing humor. I don't know anyone, certainly at this table. I have never met anyone who would have called themselves a satirist in any job I, I worked at. Uh, but the people who do comedy, uh, um, it's it's a romantic and self-aggrandizing notion to think that what you're doing is dangerous. You're a heroic figure, and oh, the powerful people are going to smite you because you're such a threat to them. You are not. Corporate capitalism is so much more powerful than your little TV show will ever be. But um, it doesn't mean that ideas don't count and that you don't make a difference. Um, it's just that it happens much, much, much more slowly. And I think the function of, of, of of your show in, in particular, I can see it with my, I have a 24 year old daughter, and you see it that her way of constructing an idea of the world is shaped by your show. And, and it happens, you know, again, and I know it's, I'm, how do you think I feel? Um, uh, <laughs> but, but, actually, quite good. Uh, but it happens really, really slowly, and I think if, if we didn't believe in the power of ideas, none of us would do what, what we did. It's just that it doesn't happen that, oh, you're going to write a great joke, and then the president will go, why, I realize the error of my ways, I resign. It, it doesn't work like that. And there's this um, great thing that Orwell said. He says, um, um, progress is not an illusion. It happens, but it's slow and invariably disappointing. <laughs> anyway, I interrupted you. I only just wanted to, uh, first of all, I remember someone, uh, I think, uh, someone who was very articulate saying, like, the, the best satire of the last century was in 1930s Germany and the rise of Hitler, basically, and it seemed to not change much. Um, uh, I, I did want to address what you were speaking about with the, the presidency uh, now, and I, and I 
also wanted to call out The Daily Show for uh, doing a tremendous job of, I feel like, making plenty of jokes about the administration. Um, I mean, and, you know, I, I don't think that there is, there are jokes about them being the first African-American family uh, in the White House, but I think there are plenty of jokes about people's fear about that or people's uncomfortability about that. And I, I, I think those, those jokes have been made. I think there are a lot of them. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was, uh, when I started The Daily Show, it was very, very long ago, and um, it was like the last year that Clinton was in office. And when uh, Bush was elected, I remember how many people came up to me and said, you guys are done. How are you ever gonna make jokes about Bush? <laughs> they, they, they said it about Obama, too. You know, boy, I bet you guys are sad he's going. And when Obama came in, I'm like, no, you know, it's, it's, it's never, first of all, I don't, I don't my job isn't that important to me that I really want, you know, the wrong president just to make my job easier. <laughs> really, I, you know, I could drive a cab uh, and live in a perfect utopia. Um, uh, uh, well, thank you for the, the, all, all the, the compliments for our show. Uh, the um, making fun of Obama, you know, ev everybody, when, when, people, when people complain about comedians, it's usually, well, that's not fair. Would you say that, if you said that about X, would you say that about Y? And invariably, the answer is no. But the reason is usually not be why, why they're thinking. Everybody you're making fun of has a you have a different line of attack on them, and you have a different line of attack on Obama than you did on Bush. And is it because he's black? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, that changes the way people think about it. And and and, and it's because that's what the culture gives you into that person. Uh, and here, the there was we had a really interesting uh, discussion about a week ago when we were talking about uh, Obama's open mic gaff, uh, where he tells Medvedev, uh, Medvedev, uh, you know, this is my last election, ease up on this missile defense stuff and, uh, and we can talk in, in six months time, falling exactly into the, uh, the, the crazed uh, uh, rhetoric that's coming from the far right about what's gonna happen once Obama has no more uh, elections to worry about. Uh, and so we, we, were, we, we were sitting there going, you know, okay, this was a, first of all, we know presidents talk like this behind closed doors and think like this. You know, Bush did it, everybody, everybody did it. Uh, so, you know, is that really a crime to think like that? Not really, but we got, you know, if you fall directly into your, if, if, if you talk in an open mic and give your opponents exactly the talking point that they've been trying to paint you with, then you gotta, you gotta take a swing at the guy for that. And, and so we did. Um, but, but then, uh, you know, we were talking for a long time about what our problem was with this, with that quote. And it's not because we believe that Obama's going to sell us out next year. You know, he had, I think his explanation was pretty clear, uh, and, and credible. Uh, but then, it, uh, John Oliver, um, said, well, the problem, he's the one who said, the problem is he's, he's explaining that the president can't even be president except for this short amount of time a year away from elections on either side. Because you, once you're, as soon as you're in an election year, he can't make a deal with the Russians. Well, guess what happens after the next election? The midterm elections. Can't make any deals with the Russians then either. So there's this in tiny window uh, in which he can actually follow a policy that he believes in. And he, and he, fell, and he was falling into that, uh, that system. He, he was playing that game. Uh, and it took a guy who comes from a country where elections last three weeks to, to, to see that. And so as soon as he said that, it's like, yes, that, that is the line there. Uh, and that's, that's what we ended up doing. But, um, you know, it, there's, there's different lines of attack on everybody. I, don't, you know, I, think, I think Obama has a pretty good sense of humor, but eh, you sometimes get the idea that he's a little sensitive too. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I've never met the guy. Uh, but. Uh, I, worked in, I worked in politics for a while, and I, I'm just reflecting on this in a way. I, I have a very uh, dual existence. I, I, I write every day, and I try to be funny for three or four hours a day, and then I come here. <laughs> and I do think um, I, I do think there's something appropriate about this. I feel as if there are citadels where we think certain types of discourse are appropriate, and that that's fine. Um, I, I could make a joke right now, and anybody who's ever performed stand-up knows this: that even the effect of standing on a change, uh, st standing on a stage, transforms the type of dialogue that you have with folks. So I could say one thing to you at the dinner table, and it wouldn't seem funny but uh, a few of my students are in the audience. If I say it in class, it seems funny because it's audacious, because I'm stepping out of the role. There are a lot of process points that comedians are sensitive to. So if you're making fun of 
the Obama thing, just the fact that a man who has a, a Harvard Law School degree didn't think to cover up the microphone and repeat a mistake is something that you can latch on to. Um, but I, first of all, I just want to second what you said. I, I saw, I worked on Ruth Messenger's, no, none of you will remember this was. I worked on Ruth Messenger's campaign. I remember Rudy Giuliani doing, they have a bit which is like the National Press Club bit. Mm -hmm. He was so extraordinarily unfunny, right? And you just wish that he hadn't even tried at all. There's no expectation that he should be funny. I remember him going on Saturday Night Live. I thought he was incredibly unfunny, that he was being made fun of. But that's fine. We didn't elect none of us who voted for Barack Obama, voted for him on the expectation that he would be punster in chief. Um, <laughs> we expect him to elevate civic dialogue. And if I had dinner with him, I would think that he would open up to me, perhaps, and be funny in a way that he never could. And I just say, as I try to dance among these universes, I joke to my wife all the time. I sit in meetings and I say, I could clear this room out in 30 seconds. And I don't do it uh, because I understand that that's not an appropriate, uh, or maybe on my last day on the job, I will clear out the room. But I understand that that's not what's expected when I'm having civic discourse in a public dialogue with fellow faculty members or with students. And, um, and that's OK. And you know, if they want to come see me perform stand up one time, that's fine. And they'll understand that I'm performing a different role. So I, uh, I excuse Obama for being, for not engaging in that dialogue, because I don't think it's part of the job. We have time for a few more questions. I know there's one up there. Um, somebody up there said that when the uh, object of your satire comes on your show, you know that uh, you're not doing anything to bring them down. I, I would like that. to, uh, excuse me? I, said. I, would, I would like to propose one exception, and that was when Sarah Palin went on Saturday Night Live. Tina Fey. Oh, yeah, sure, make the knucklehead excuse. <laughs> yeah. Tina Fey and SNL killed her candidacy. The interview with Charlie Gibson and Katie Couric was seen by the wonkies. The funny version of it was seen by everybody. Um, well, history will sort that out whether Katie Couric or. or look, look, Sarah Palin's a bonehead. And, and, and every time she opens her mouth, her boneheadedness is revealed. We, we, we're ourselves. And, and, and I think. Even without Tina Fey, her boneheadedness was revealed. But I leave it to, I don't know, what, what discipline dis discusses well, I mean, why we, she lost? I think we're in agreement that it's, it's pretty rare that, first of all, it's pretty rare that satire, comedy decides to be satire, and satire gets up on stilts to sort of teach people morals in a direct way. Um, but it seems to me uh, the comedy that you write, the satire that we study, can encourage us to see things differently, right? To sort of tr trouble things that would otherwise maybe pass. Uh, and in that spirit of provocation or inquiry, you know, I think you guys do a great deal, right? I, I know that, you know, the, there's, there's good reasons to not want to take too much credit or to pat yourself on the back or to think you're having too great an effect than you might. Did, did Tina Fey destroy her candidacy? I think that's a tough call, but I think it certainly just, cre just propagated the problem of Sarah Palin in a way that it might not have been propagated otherwise. I mean, what do you think? I, just, I, I would just like to note that it was a towering, towering uh, comic achievement that year. It was, it, it was absolutely incredible, and uh, I, don't, I don't know whether it, it knocked her out or if that would have happened anyway, but. Uh, it, it, you know, the, all people have mistaken lines from that, from those sketches for her actual lines, and that's that. You know, that hasn't happened very often in history, probably. Uh, but it, it was it was incredible to watch, and we're, we were lucky to see it. Uh, I, I think politicians. My experience is there. There are a few, like you know, there are a few qualifying things. There's a checklist of things that you have to do. And going on Leno, what what are you really doing? You're not going on Leno to prove that you can be as Leno, bad example, so nobody could be funny on Leno, but whatever. You're not going on, uh, on Letterman uh, to prove that you could be as funny as Letterman. You're going on Letterman to pass a litmus test, a very minimal litmus test, which is never really dispositive, which is that I can operate and take myself briefly not seriously enough to have a conversation like that. It's a very, very minimal showing. So when Sarah Palin went on Saturday Night Live, she passed that test, right? She passed that test in so much as she said, okay, I can briefly not take myself seriously. Now, where she failed is she didn't appear to comprehend the joke that was being made about her. And really, look, it's a substantive critique of her. What was the problem there, which was she didn't pass another litmus test, which is you go on David Gregory or you go on a show. I guess it was Russert at the time. Was it Russert? You go on Meet the Press to show that you can 
uh, stand up to questioning like that. And to some extent, the answers to the question are beside the point. It's demonstrating your ability to face a level of interrogation like that, and that's what she's, that's what her, her, her crime was. And, and, and the other failure is that after uh, appearing and, and, and uh, showing that she has a sense of humor, she still complained about the sketches afterward. <laughs> you know, you can't go on the show and then, then go back to your audience and talk about how you were victimized by Saturday Night Live. Jay? Uh, so, I, I, I've been sitting at this conference and I've, I've for you know since last night, and I've been thinking about the the great discussion concerning public reason and the importance of public reason in achieving justice. And I have to admit that I've consistently. Oh boy, it's getting late. <laughs> <laughs> Sit there, you got five more and, minutes. <laughs> and I've consistently sat there saying, "Wow, I don't know that I." think public reason exists anymore. Um, in a post-Carl Schmitt world in which it's all about motivation of groups and mobs and uh, in a sort of Guy Debord society of the spectacle where individual reason seems to be complete failure, my question sort of becomes, is satire something that plays into mobilizing masses to think one way or another within this society of the spectacle? Or is it sort of a toothless wish of those without power to try to affect public reason. While on the other side, I would say those who have no sense of humor attack the powerless like academics. Uh, and we can go right back to Sarah Palin. Um, you know, we don't want a professor, we want a president, we want a leader, right? Um, so I'm totally acknowledging myself in the powerless. But how do you see it playing into that? Do you see yourselves playing into promoting public reason, is that actually possible? From what you do. I'll call on one of you. <laughs> uh, um, I do. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there are, I would say, certainly the majority of the time it is toothless, but you live for those times when it's not toothless. Um, and 90%, uh, I, I'm talking, speaking now, because I'm speaking, of course, about how political Portlandia is. No. Um, uh, uh, for the other shows, for Colbert, you know, 90, I feel like 60%, 70%, as you say, more. It uh, was really very strictly humor. But um, Stephen and the whole team, uh, but obviously he is uh, 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 the head, is an extraordinarily moral person with very um, heartfelt and passionate feelings. Um, and to proceed with a comedy show in which there wasn't some um, hope to do that, I think, would be sort of against his nature, to be honest. Um, I, I see it slightly differently, that, that it, in the short term, um, very little effect. Um, not because that's a particular quality of comedy, but that's a particular quality of how ideas work in any culture. That, that um, um, certainly, the shows we're talking about here, um, introduce um, aspects, contribute as certain aspects to public discourse that wouldn't be heard any other place. But, but it, 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 is, it is a wishful thinking to believe that, that a week of shows will then result in observable change. That's not how ideas work in a culture. Ideas permeate the culture much more slowly, and you change people's thinking much more slowly. And, and, but there's all kinds of, that, that's not a pessimistic point of view, it's an optimistic point of view. For instance, uh, we get to win on gay marriage because um, uh, the people who are just wrong about it will die. Um, um, and they, they, every year more of them die. And people who grew up with another set of discourse, uh, partly just the comedy writers of Will and Grace. Yeah, Randy is uh, trying to get us to murder people, but I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell them why they die, yeah. uh, or how they die. Um, but so that's that, the fun. That, that people grow up with these new ideas, and then those people will then eventually go and vote, and, and we get to win on that. Uh, and, th and that's how ideas work, including comedy as an expression of a style in which certain ideas work. But I would, I would say that uh, uh, Colbert works slightly different from that, in that the show actually does not exist purely as ideas, but as actions as well. 
And part of what uh, he does is interact with the real world. Um, that's obviously what the super PAC uh, is about. And, um, and I think that that's an interaction that you know we'll see. Um, but um, that sort of interaction, I think, possibly, the hope is it could affect change more quickly. Um, so I actually have a related question. Uh, since this is a conference on law and justice, I was wondering if you guys could talk about the relationship between satire and justice. Is it to point out injustices or um, is ethical comedy that I believe Randy mentioned, is it more than just a guideline but actually an, an essential component to satire? Or are they not at all related? Um, it's, it's really, really hard to be funny in praise of something. So, so it's uh, most comedy attacks. And, and the interesting questions then become, well, whom are you attacking and why are you attacking them? So, so comedy can do that. And if, if that discourse can contribute to a, 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 a clarity of vision about how the world is and then that can then contribute to ISIS about justice, great. But um, I, I, as unlike Allison thinks it happens a, a little more slowly. Um, you know, this is, this is actually a central uh, theme of Sen's work. Uh, it's maybe useful to bring it in here. I, I mean, I, I teach about this stuff all the time. I, I don't think there's, it's a mistake to ever privilege any particular conception of the good. Uh, I think if you are operating, particularly in a university, um, that you have to respect a diversity of viewpoints. What I think the distinction that I would draw is, I don't really see such a cut and dried distinction between comedy and serious people. I think everybody is funny some of the time and funny people are serious some of the time. Um, I think that either you're operating out of hate uh, or on the basis of superficial qualities of people or you're advancing an idea. And I think everybody who's not in the former category uh, belongs in the other, is in the other category and is contributing to the discussion about justice. It's a mistake, uh, it so happens, I was gonna cite the example of Colbert. Um, I thought the super PAC example is a, is a great one. He's making a statement, it happens to be very funny. Um, and you, it, it's inevitable, he must have been thinking about affecting some change. It doesn't make any sense for him to engage in that. Now that doesn't make him right. Right? Uh, it's very hard for me to conceive the argument that super PACs are justified, but a majority of the Supreme Court thought that they were, and they're not stupid people, so maybe it's our duty to try to figure out what it is that they're trying to say. And uh, he's contributing to that dialogue. I, I just think it's very important off the bat not to say that because we disagree with people that we have a, that we, uh, have a, a, a privileged position. And, and I do think, um, you know, I, I just read this, I just want to go back to this distinction between funny and not funny. The last novel I read was Emma Donahue's Room. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's a great novel, in my opinion. And um, it's a very serious subject. There's a, uh, a, a woman who's, uh, who's kidnapped and um, incar incarcerated against her will in a room where she raises a child. And um, there's this great moment where she plots this elaborate escape and she escapes and she's been nursing her child who's five years old at the time. And that's what the news media focuses on, right? And she says this, the character in the book says, oh, I was locked up in a, by, in a room by a man who raped me for five years and you're focusing on the fact that I still nurse my child? And I think it's an extraordinarily funny moment in the book. Um, I've read, I was interested in her, I've read some interviews with her. I, I don't think that she sees herself as a comedian. But uh, everybody has the uh, opportunity to illustrate their points in however they want. And I think that so long as you're not calling, you know, using invective or, or calling people uh, disparaging names, then you're contributing to the dialogue and we shouldn't privilege one viewpoint over another. That, it's, that's a really interesting point you bring up, Evan, about people who we disagree with. Um, and I guess the, the, the trouble I'm having squaring, uh, like putting, uh, you know, our particular brands of comedy into a vision of justice is that there are vast swaths of America that don't get jokes I write. They just don't get them. 
they don't, and if they, you know, they don't see them, and if they did, they wouldn't laugh. So how could that possibly fit into a, a, a system of justice that we can use? I, you know, those, yes, when we start getting into, you know, the, that's one of the reasons I try not to think too big about, about what I do, because, you know, I, I immediately I'm swimming with issues like that. Well, maybe. Yes, I, I just wanted to uh, ask a question about whether you see yourself as educators or just entertainers, because um, I, I love the Colbert Report and The Daily Show. I think uh, the word, the section of the Colbert Report, it's, it's, uh, it's really very educated. So and most of the time, what I remember about their shows is the idea. It's not just whether it was really funny or not. So when you when you were uh, you know saying something, how much educative do you think do you want it to be, or would you just oh it's funny I observed it I just want somebody to laugh or do you say I want somebody to learn something from this? Uh, um, so one of the harder things about those shows is. Uh, for me at least, was how much I had to educate myself while I was writing the jokes because, you know, uh, there were so many subjects that I was and continue to be not well versed in or things would be happening very quickly. And, um, and there were a lot of stories where you felt like, okay, in order to sort of uh, uh, communicate this, there's going to have to be the same education that I went through in the last, you know, however long, day or two, to write this piece, I'm going to have to communicate to people in a minute and a half or something. Um, so in, in that sense, and that was sort of a real uh, uh, challenge and kind of fun in its own way to sort of figure out how to just get sort of the background and information in, uh, there. Um, and I think similarly with the word, which as you can imagine is a really, really uh, tough piece to write. It's very... Uh, uh, a lot of sweat that goes into it. Um, and I, I think the process of writing it, you would often discover what it was about or what you were trying to say in that process. And then your hope was to give that same experience to the audience. Um, so, so I would say that I don't think it, it was educational in the sense of, in any sense of like, uh, there's an attempt to really we are teaching you something, but hopefully it's more communal. Like I have, I think that I have learned this thing and we're all kind of learning it together. I, but um, what you say about going home with the, the idea, um, certainly thinking of some of those words, which are obviously the most sort of serious part of the show, um, is really gratifying actually. So thank you very much for, for saying it. Well, uh, let me sort of break in here. Uh, note that we're pretty much at time, and uh, it might make sense to try to wrap things up. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to attempt a synthesis of anything, but uh, I do want to ask a last question to all of our panelists uh, that would require a short but not necessarily an easy answer, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll preface it with some uh, a thought from Jonathan Swift, uh, a great writer of satire who also had tremendous reservations about what it might actually be good for. Uh, he once wrote this, satire is a sort of glass wherein beholders do generally discover everybody's face but their own, which is the chief reason for the kind reception it meets with in the world and that so few are offended with it. So what do people see when they view your satire? Left with so few are with offended with it. Offended, offended with it? Mm -hmm. So what do people see when they view your My, my, I don't think of what I do is satire, but obviously it, that's kind of the job description, so I guess I do it. Um, the, it's really, uh, I, I feel like at a, at a creative level, I'm uh, sort of counterpunching. I'm, I'm presented with something that, uh, that affects me a certain way, and I just smack back. And, you know, some of the best jokes, as everybody up here will attest, are, you know, are written in, in the tenth of a second that it takes your brain to go, what? And you have it. <laughs> And not all of them, but you know that's the, the, the germ of it will take that long to, to, to hit, and sometimes the entire joke. Um, so I, 
I, I can't possibly, uh, you know, add to Jonathan Swift in a meaningful way. But this, I'm actually thinking a little more about the justice question from a couple more on the, a couple of ago on this, the second row. Maybe this, the this this is my way of just of just battling back, of of hitting back at things that offend me. And it's no more civil than that, and it's no prettier than that. And but you know, that's a system of justice too. Combat. <laughs> Maybe that's. That's about what I would like to leave it with. Uh, I'm actually a character in most of my books, so uh, I, I'm sure people reflect on me. I mean, I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, Vonnegut used to do this. I think it's a really interesting, uh, I just lost my, uh, my train of thought. I think what's, what's very, um, I think about with Colbert a lot, is that a, a lot of times what's going on in comedy is somebody's assuming a persona, right? So Stephen Colbert is different than Stephen Colbert, right? And he's very conscious of this, and we as the audience are very conscious of this. And to some extent, um, there was even just a Times Magazine article, with, right, a, a profile of him, which I thought really hit upon this in an interesting way. To some extent, what we're responding to, you see this with Stewart too, is the intellectual game. What would Colbert say about this? And we know that Colbert is expect is. It's thinking that we're asking that question, so he's, what will my audience expect me to think about this? And it becomes a very interesting exercise to reflect on what we think people will expect us playing our role. And we all play roles in, in, in life, right? All of us are, are different in different contexts. And um, I just can't help but thinking that what, com to the extent that I would say anything, as a, in, you know, to the extent I have an identity as a comedian, what I always found that comedians contribute is a really nuanced, careful attention to detail. Uh, and in some, to some extent, that's what all, all good writers do, right? But you're, you're paying attention, and you think about that story with John Oliver, how he thought about that, right? That, 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 minute, that minute aspect of the extension of Obama's argument. And that, that to me, is, is really the essence of the contribution. Sorry, Allison, did you want to say? No. Well, I think if that's uh, where we're at, then I think we should put our hands together and thank our panel for a really thoughtful conversation.